Hi there, welcome back to Bush History. This is topic 30. This is a uh, video about the George W. Bush administration, 2001 through 2009. Uh, George Bush certainly did not have the easiest time in office, and it didn't start out easy, it didn't stay easy, and it didn't end easy. And today we're going to take a look at issues that began at the beginning of his presidency, including the election, uh, we'll talk a little bit about September 11th because certainly it defined his presidency and the fallout of September 11th and the aftermath of September 11th. And finally, at the end of his presidency, the whole recession that occurred in 2007 through 2009. Remember, everything I do here is available on my website, www.bushhistory.net. This will be topic 30 and this PowerPoint will be available for download for you to take a look at. So let's take a look at what happens here. A disputed rise to power, George Bush did not have a mandate at the beginning of his presidency. The 2000 presidential election was too close to call. Florida's electors were in debate. At first, the call went for Al Gore in 2000. And then, well, they hadn't finished counting in Florida. And you remember how the way this works is in most states, Florida being one of them, the person who wins the majority of the popular vote gets the electoral vote. Well, in Florida, it was a seesaw battle. Uh, two recounts occurred because it was so close once it was awarded for George Bush. Uh, uh, Al Gore wanted a third one. In a Supreme Court case of Gore v. Bush, the Supreme Court decided on a 5-4 to four decision that Florida should stop counting and award their electoral votes. And of course, when they stopped counting, George Bush was in the lead. Al Gore was not. And when Florida awarded its electoral votes, it awarded them for George Bush. And what was interesting about that particular Supreme Court case, they said it was non-precedent setting. And it applied only to this situation right now. So any future disputes could not be based on that Supreme Court decision. Let's take a closer look. To give you an idea how unsettling all of this was, take a look at Newsweek. We have a morphed picture of Al Gore and George Bush. Take a look at this newspaper person holding these newspapers with Bush and recount, Hillary wins, Bush and Gore, Florida deadline finish, and things like that. I was driving home election eve that night, election eve that year, I should say, and Al Gore was pronounced the winner of Florida's electoral votes and the winner of the presidential race. So for a short period of time, Al Gore thought he had won the election until the numbers were coming back as too close to count. And then they swung the other way, and then things really got interesting. Here is a CNN pronouncing Al Gore the winner of Florida's electoral votes. And take a look at this. This is CNN with 99% of the precincts reporting, giving George Bush 49%, giving Al Gore 49%. And take a look at how close these two races are about 60,000 votes, which is absolutely incredible. And let the games begin. This is the electoral map from 2000. And as you see, there's a lot of red states. There's a lot of blue states. And the blue states have more electoral votes, so you see how close this actually was. 271 for George Bush, 266 electors for Al Gore. So he loses, Al Gore loses by five electoral votes, and George Bush wins by five, which means he doesn't really have a mandate. Not only that, if you take a look at the popular vote, the popular vote has Al Gore winning. So more people actually voted for Al Gore than for George Bush, but because of the anomalies of the Electoral College, George Bush wins, which simply means that when he actually becomes president, when George Bush actually becomes president, he's going to preside over a divided nation with more people thinking he shouldn't be president. That's a tough way to begin. While the counting was going on, we developed a new language. Remember, they had to recount the votes in Florida. They recounted them actually more than once. This poor gentleman here looking at this, this is a computer punch card. In Florida, they voted by pushing out dimples in these cards. And here's an example of a hole. Someone would have punched it out. Well, they didn't punch out cleanly all the time. And we started to have new terms coming up. We had chads. 
Chads were the piece of paper that came out from these little holes. And a chad that wasn't completely through was a dangling chad. It wasn't completely punched out. Or one that was partially punched out was labeled a pregnant chad or a dimpled chad. And it was up to the recounters who were carrying by hand to figure out which was which. Because an intent to vote was a vote. Even if someone didn't get the chad through all the way, it was considered a vote. So you had the Gore people watching, you had the Bush people watching, and you had a lot of controversy. And of course, we have books written on the topic. So George Bush becomes president. When he becomes president in January of 2001, he inherits the largest budget surplus in American history. And while not having a mandate, the economy was, was, was moving along. It wasn't great, but it was moving along. And then September 11th hits. And we all know what happened September 11th. 19 militants associated with the Islamic extremist group Al-Qaeda hijacked four airliners. Two of them are going to hit the World Trade Center in New York. I was teaching in New York at the time. I cannot even explain how traumatic it was to be a high school teacher in New York and get phone calls into my classroom asking for students to be removed from my classroom because they were unsure what the status of their parents were. It was incredible. And I was about, oh, an hour away. I taught in a small town in, a, in the middle of New York State. Anyway, uh, a third plane hit the Pentagon, and a fourth plane was brought down in a field in Pennsylvania, and the world changed. To this day, to this day, when I drive through New York and I see these two towers missing, it feels like someone took something, and I want it back, and the new tower really doesn't replace those two towers, and certainly the lives that were lost. 2,977 were killed in the combined attacks, and that's the people in the towers and the people on planes. <clears throat> so now it launches the United States into a change mentality. The war on terror begins, oh, about 2002, 2003, and goes to who knows. It was response to the terrorist attacks of September 11th, leads us into Afghanistan and Iraq, leads us into a controversial piece of legislation known as the Patriot Act, and causes that surplus to disappear into deficit and debt. There were other contributing factors to the end of that surplus, but certainly a huge part of it was that deficit and that debt. So we get the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was an omnibus bill shortly after September 11th in October of 2001, and what it did is it expanded the surveillance of law enforcement facilities around the United States, allowed for a much greater leeway in what uh, the CIA could do and what local law enforcement could do in investigating people to prevent future terrorist attacks. Because one of the things that an investigation was highly critical of was a lack of information about these terrorists. That one group knew some information, but another government group didn't know some information, and it would have been cool if they could have somehow coalesced this together for a more complete picture. And here is George Bush signing that Patriot Act. Then, in October of 2001, we go into Afghanistan. We begin bombing Afghanistan, looking for Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Al-Qaeda, it was believed, was behind the attacks of September 11th, and bin Laden was the leader of Al-Qaeda. So we go into Al-Qaeda, we go into Afghanistan, I'm sorry, and Afghanistan, strange, strange country for fighting a war. It's really not a nation as much as it's a collection of villages and towns separated by mountains. And no nation has ever been successful in conquering Afghanistan. The Soviet Union tried it in the 1980s, and they couldn't do it. So I don't know why we thought we'd be able to do it 20 years later. But nevertheless, we're going to try it. Here is some, here's some information about it. First of all, this is Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq. So in between the two wars for Afghanistan and Iraq is Iran, certainly not a friend of the United States and certainly a turbulent area of the world. To Afghanistan's east, we have Pakistan. To Afghanistan's north, we start to hit the former Soviet republics. Some information about Afghanistan specifically. As of April 2011, the last year I get numbers on from the Congressional Budget Office, $403 billion was spent fighting in Afghanistan. $3.6 billion monthly. 
the cost of deploying one U.S. soldier for one year in Afghanistan, that includes training, that includes his pay, which certainly isn't that much, and that includes keeping him there with all the supplies and equipment he needs, about a million dollars. As of 2011, the amount of troop casualties in Afghanistan, we have 1,562, and wounded, we have 11,314. The total U.S. troops in Afghanistan, 94,000 94, as of May 2011, and we certainly surged above that. The Iraq War. While we're fighting in Afghanistan, we also go into Iraq. March 20, 2003, UN coalition forces, led by the United States, invaded Iraq. So we're going to go in and we're going to get people in Iraq that we think are somehow harboring terrorists or preparing to do bad stuff for us. There was no direct connection between Iraq and September 11th. The information was a little different. We were given information, or we were told information, by Colin Powell at the United Nations that Iraq was working on weapons of mass destruction. And the idea there was, was we didn't want Saddam Hussein harboring terrorists and preparing and arming these terrorists for use against the United States. Well, here we have American soldiers going into Baghdad, and here we have in March of, two, excuse me, May of 2003, George Bush on an aircraft carrier where it says, mission accomplished, two months after the invasion of Iraq. I have to tell you, 10 years later, the debate still is whether the mission was accomplished. Troops were in Iraq an awful lot longer than just those couple of months. So again, taking a look, this is Iraq, this is Iran, Iraq right next to Syria and Jordan, right, north of, right just north of Saudi Arabia, a strong ally of the United States. Saudi Arabia actually helped in terms of footing some of the bill and allowing U.S. forces to be stationed there on in the invasion in Iraq. So. Uh, a pretty turbulent time for the United States. You can understand why that deficit disappeared very quickly. Think about it. Two wars and everything that went along with increased security in the United States, and that's not all. So here we go. Based on faulty intelligence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. They used chemical weapons against the Kurds in Iraq, and that is true. There's a very good movie uh, called Fair Game. And in this movie, it talks about this faulty information that we had and that Colin Powell was fed wrong information and that wrong information was used by the White House in committing troops to Iraq. This is Colin Powell, he was Secretary of State at the time and he is speaking to the UN General Assembly and the Security Council. It's February 5th, 2003 and he testified that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Well, it didn't turn out that way. They never found a thing. So we went into Iraq and we didn't find any weapons of mass destruction. This link will show you his actual uh, speech and discussion at the UN. Shortly thereafter, when uh, Colin Powell realized it wasn't going the way it was supposed to, he resigned. He decided he didn't want to be Secretary of State anymore, but he never said anything negative about the Bush administration's efforts in Iraq. Here we have some facts and figures about Iraq, about the war in Iraq. As of May 2011, when I compile this information, 47,000 U.S. troops, all the nations had withdrawn their troops. There was a surge. There was a surge towards the end of the Bush administration when troops hit 150,000. But as of May 2011, we had 47,000. Today, in 2014, there are no American troops left in Iraq. Iraq, unfortunately, has descended into turmoil. U.S. troop casualties, 33,186 U.S. troops, 98% of those male, 91% non-officers, 82% active duty. I'm not going to read the rest of this for you. You see the numbers are pretty high, though. U.S. troops wounded, 30,182, 20% of which are serious brain or spinal injuries, which has become an increasingly tough situation after the war. We have a lot of wounded veterans who are in deep need of medical care, and I actually know a couple of them, and they're having difficulty getting that medical care. I have several students, students that went to Iraq. Another interesting thing that occurred on the Iraq war was multiple deployments, or what they call stop losses. We didn't have a draft. We don't have a draft. So in order to keep troop strength up, enlistments were extended. So soldiers would come home, and instead of being able to get out of the military, they redeployed back to Iraq. 
people were deployed as many as five times. That's an awful lot of time to be in a combat zone, and you can understand the psychological problems that probably came from it as well. U.S. spending in Iraq, about $900 billion as of November 2010. That'll go a long way to uh, using up that surplus. Loss on the calendar for in Iraq, $9 billion of U.S. taxpayers' money and $549.7 million in spare parts. Also, ABC News reported 190,000 guns, including 110,000 AK-47 rifles. So these supplies were ending up where they should not have ended up, and we didn't know where that was. We just knew it wasn't with American soldiers. Missing, $1 billion in tractors trailers. So our trucks disappeared. Tank recovery vehicles, they disappeared. Machine guns disappeared. Rocket-propelled grenades disappeared. I gotta tell you, I don't think these are the things you want flying around someplace and hanging around on the wrong hands. Some of this and the idea that no weapons of mass destruction were ever found really brought the, uh, the Iraq war into question. It really questioned the actions of the Bush administration. They really questioned whether George Bush went in to get Saddam Hussein and break up Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war and mass destruction or whether there was something else to it. Some people said it was daddy's war. It was to make up for the Persian Gulf War when we didn't get Saddam Hussein. I personally think it's a bunch of nonsense, but some people do say it's the military industrial complex, which I happen to believe. Halliburton is a major, major U.S. manufacturer of an industrial, an industrial business. Made a lot of money, and Halliburton, hmm, Dick Cheney had been on the board of directors of Halliburton before he was vice president of the United States, and they were getting all of these contracts. So you have to debate some of this, which is why it became highly controversial in the United States. And unfortunately, it wasn't controversial enough, because you could read the paper on several days and see nothing about the Iraq war while there were soldiers dying there. The cost of deploying one U.S. soldier for one year in Iraq, 390000 a lot less expensive than Afghanistan. And I don't know why. I don't understand it, but again, um, Congressional Budget Office, Congressional Research Service. The Bush recession. Well, if things weren't bad enough during the Bush administration with Iraq, with Afghanistan, with the disputed election, and with September 11th, which is an awful lot on the plate, towards the end of his administration, the economy bust like a balloon popping. From December 7th, 2007 through June of 2009, a massive recession hit in the United States. The housing bubble burst. Throughout most of the 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 period, housing prices kept going higher and higher and higher in the United States. Those housing prices were being fueled by a huge increase in demand. Demand will pull prices up. It's called demand pull inflation. Well, it was being fueled, the housing prices were being fueled by an increase in demand because banks had relaxed their standards for lending money. So more people are borrowing money. More people with questionable ability to repay that money and with low credit ratings, but the banks were lending the money anyway. Very irresponsible, very irresponsible. Harkens back to what happened in the 1920s when banks were lending money to buy stocks. Now banks are lending money to people to buy houses who aren't gonna be able to afford to repay them. And it gets better. Banks were offering teaser rates called subprime teaser rates, meaning if the interest rates were 6 and 7%, the banks were offering 3% interest rates, but only for a year. And after a year, the interest rate would rise, and that mortgage that had been $1,100 a month was now $1,800 a month. And it would rise every month thereafter. So someone who was only marginally able to purchase a house because it was at the top of his income limits, a year later can't afford to stay in that house anymore. So, what happened was, in, because of irresponsible lending to encourage home purchases, inflating housing prices collapsed. Eventually, eventually those housing prices were too high and people stopped being able to pay their mortgages. People had these adjustable rate mortgages, which meant the first year, as I said, the rate was low, but then it would go higher and higher and higher, and they couldn't afford to stay in those houses. People were upside down on their mortgages, meaning when people were unable to buy houses anymore, because of credit problems, housing prices started to dip. 
So you bought a house for 300000 last year, but because housing prices in your neighborhood have dipped, your house is now worth $200,000, and you owe more than that house is worth. And then people did things like just walking away. Unable to pay, many just walked away. My brother called it jingle mail one time. He said people would put keys in an envelope, mail them back to the bank, and just leave. And we started to have vacant houses. Vacant houses in the neighborhood further bring down housing values. How is all of this going to impact on the economy? Just think about that for a second before going to the next slide. You have people unable to pay back their mortgages. You have banks with huge debt on their balance sheets from all these mortgages that they owe this money they lent out on in terms of mortgages and people not paying it back. Well, let's see how that impacts things. Banks are going to lose billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. And remember, banks are a money store. Banks exist to lend money. Banks do not exist to keep your money safe. The minute you deposit money in a bank, it goes out being lent to somebody else. Generally, for business, because that's where the predominant amount of business is for bank. They lend money to businesses to expand their business or to meet daily expenses, whatever it might be. So, banks lost billions. That meant a loss, a loss of available credit. If banks don't have the money, they can't lend money. Not only that, they're going, it's going to cause a loss of spending. Because if banks can't lend money, people aren't going to spend money. Businesses aren't going to spend money. Consumption is going to drop. If consumption drops, businesses want to produce less. So there's going to be a loss of business investment. If there's a loss of business investment, then businesses aren't going to hire. Not only are they not going to hire, they're going to reduce their workforce. They're going to lay people off, and you're going to get unemployment skyrocketing. It's going to go sky high. I'll show you in a graph exactly what that looks like. And this cycle is going to continue again and again and again, we are a consumption-based economy, and a lot of that consumption is based on the use of credit. If banks don't have the money to lend, or if they're unwilling to lend that money, credit purchases do not occur. Things like automobiles and homes, those are the two biggest things people use credit for, those are going to occur. And if those things are not purchased, think about all the jobs that are impacted. Not only that, it's not just those things. People get laid off, they're going to stop going to the food store as much to buy uh, you know, disposable things, things they don't need. They're going to stop going to the mall to buy things they don't need. Of course they'll buy staples in the food store. Of course they'll buy things in the mall, but those extras are going to disappear and they're probably going to buy less even of the things they need. 8.4 million jobs lost, the most since the Great Depression back in the 1930s. And in the middle, in the middle of this recession, we're going to have a very interesting election. We're going to have John McCain, a wily old politician, the Vietnam War veteran, the Vietnam War POW, against Barack Obama, the charismatic African-American candidate who stands a chance to be the first African-American president. Of course, Barack Obama in the primaries is running against Hillary Clinton, and that's a game all unto itself. Well, we know now how this ends up, but imagine this happening in the middle of this recession. John McCain is going to be tied to George Bush, whether he wants it or not, and Republican ideology, and the recession is going to be blamed on the Republicans because they have a Republican president. Right or wrong, it doesn't matter. When you're in that seat, you get blamed. The Democrat was Barack Obama, and he would become the first African-American president. If you take a look at this electoral map for the 2008 election, you see that John McCain had only 173 electoral votes, while Barack Obama had 365. And it was a party when Barack Obama won. John McCain, a good man, a good politician, he could not shake the idea that the recession is based on the Republicans, and he picked a very weak vice presidential candidate when he picked Sarah Palin. Uh, Barack Obama, he picked Joe Biden, a well-known, well-liked politician. So John McCain lost miserably to Barack Obama. Barack Obama will become president in January of 2009, inheriting the recession that George Bush had, that had occurred in the waning days of the Bush presidency. So now, in this, in this recession, in the waning days of the Bush presidency, what is the government to do? Do we watch the financial institutions collapse? Lehman Brothers collapse? Bear Stearns on the verge of collapse. Do we watch that happen, or does the government step in and help? Huge debate. 
because it becomes an interventionist government at this point. And Republicans don't like intervention by the government. They want laissez-faire. They want the government to stay out of business. George Bush, he's trapped. He's trapped, as is John McCain. Because John McCain wants to win the presidency, but he also knows we have to do something to help him. And John McCain suspends his campaign, and Barack Obama suspends his campaign. Barack Obama was senator from Illinois at the time. And they're going to go back to Washington, D.C. And what they're going to do is they're going to take a look at this something called this Troubled Asset Relief Program. It's called TARP. And it's going to be the United States government injecting huge amounts of money. It's signed, by, it's signed by George Bush on October 3rd, 2008. $700 billion. $700 billion is allocated to invest in non-bank financial institution investment houses that buy stocks. Because if they go down, all the people who are invested in those financial institutions like J.P. Morgan, like uh, Merrill Lynch, they're going to lose a lot of money. And businesses that are invested are going to lose a lot of money. And pensions that are invested are going to lose a lot of money. Unemployment is going to skyrocket. And you're going to have people on the streets homeless. So, $700 billion authorized. As of December 2012, 97% of the $418 billion that was actually dispersed had been returned, had been repaid. So this ended up being money well spent, but it also, it also changed the look of the Republican Party and George Bush, because now he's tinkering with the economy. It was a tough election year sell. John McCain was between a rock and a hard place, stuck between traditional Republican ideology of laissez-faire and doing what was right. The government needed intervene, to intervene in the economy. When people are unemployed and people are losing their money, they say someone should do something. And that's what the Bush administration did. It strapped on its big boy pants and said, listen, we're going to do something to prevent unemployment from skyrocketing, people from losing their fortunes. But what it's also going to do is going to thrust Barack Obama into the presidency. More bailouts. Well, connected to this is the domestic auto industry, the American auto industry, Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford. A lot of foreign competition had occurred during the 2000s, so they lost part of their market share. Oil prices started to creep up. That's causing a further decrease in people purchasing new, larger vehicles, which is what Detroit was better known for. And on top of this, once the financial panic hits of 2007 through 2009, people aren't buying cars. So what they are producing isn't being sold, and they're losing a lot of customers as well. So the Bush administration decides to extend the bailout to the auto industries. George Bush will begin it, and Barack Obama will continue it. So the domestic auto industry, greatly impacted by the loss of credit, High unemployment, high fuel prices, and losses from investments. They are on the verge of falling apart. Think how many hundreds of thousands of jobs are lost if GM goes out of business. GM and Chrysler teetered on total failure. To give you an idea, 17 million cars were sold in 2008, but 10 million were sold in 2009. Think about that. Think about that. 7 million cars less were sold because people either didn't have jobs or could not get the credit or which is not interested in purchasing these cars. Think about the jobs that are impacted within the auto industry, not just at the GM plants and the Chrysler plants, but the people that make all the other things, the rubber companies, the plastics, the coatings in terms of the paints and stuff like that. Huge, huge if the auto industry goes out of business. So, in December of 2008, the last full month of the Bush administration, the Bush administration allocated $17 billion in loans and governed purchase of securities in Chrysler and General Motors. Ford did not take any of this bailout money. Ford was much more solvent than Chrysler and GM. They were hurting, but they weren't teetering on ruin. As of spring 2009, Chrysler and GM also filed for bankruptcy protection. When a company files for bankruptcy protection, it has to go into the legal system, it has to go into the federal court system, and it has to prove that they're having trouble remaining solvent. And if the courts approve of this, they will protect these companies from creditors, meaning Chrysler and GM do not have to pay back all of their loans, and they're analyzing which ones they can pay back their will and which ones they can't, they won't. And they have to come up with a financial plan to fix their flawed business practices, but it protects them. 
And that's what happens. And GM and Chrysler survive today because of the bailout by the federal government and because of bankruptcy protection afforded to them. But what's the cost of all of this? It's going to be a change mentality. We have a cartoon here. It says the guy who never in his mind, in his life, buy an American car is now stuck owning the whole company. That's because the federal government invested in securities in GM and Chrysler, securities meaning stocks. So they became part owners. Hmm. When a government is part owner of a major manufacturer in the country, oh my God, it's socialism. We can't have that bad word in the United States. Anyway, so we have this debate, capitalism versus socialism basically intervention level in the economy by the government. How much does the government get involved? Capitalism, obviously, unfettered competition. Socialism is government regulation. And the amount of socialism depends on the amount of government regulation. Government intervention is the government's job. Should the auto industry have simply collapsed and those hundreds of thousands of jobs disappeared? Should the banks have simply collapsed and all that money disappeared? There are some people that thought, yes, let it occur in, economic, in economics, it's called creative destruction. One industry is destroyed and another industry arises. It also gave us a tremendous deficit and debt because think about this, where is the money coming from for these bailouts? Deficit is the yearly amount of money you spend beyond your budget. Debt is the accumulation of that year after year after year. And then the credibility of the banking system. Will we trust the banking system again if the banking system operated so poorly in lending this money out and investing this money to people who were not able to repay it? Give you an idea of what we're talking about here. This is the outstanding public debt. On May 11, 2011, it was $14,332,620,173,701. On April 13th, 2014, three years later, look, it jumps to 17 trillion and change. And the scary thing is, let me queue up the website where I get this from. This is the national debt clock. If you take a look right now, and this is April 15th, 2014, 17,547,848,285,492.78. But you know what's really scary? Keep your eye on it. I encourage you to do this. Reset it. Oh, it went up again. Watch these numbers. Then do it again. It goes up again. Why does it keep going up in seconds? Because of interest. It's not just the debt, it's the interest on the debt. And that interest keeps adding and adding and adding and adding and adding. It's really incredible when you think about it. Ten years before 2009, we had the largest surplus in American history, and in 2009, we have the largest debt in American history. Let's get back to the presentation. So now, take a look at this. This is the national debt in trillions, starting back with Ronald Reagan in 1981. So it's rising. It rises again under George Bush. It still rises under. Bill Clinton, but it starts to level off here towards the end. That's when we start to have the Clinton surpluses. It goes skyrocketing under George Bush and continues into the Obama presidency. That's absolutely incredible. Remember, the debt is the accumulation of years of deficits. The debt doesn't occur in one year. It's an accumulation of each year that we spend more than we have, which is called the deficit. What we have here is a chart of deficit and debt. And if you take a look, the top one is the deficit, and the bottom one is the debt. Meaning, meaning, the deficit is variable. Depending on how much money the government needs each year, it'll borrow each year. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Each time we're below this line, this line is zero, this would be a balanced budget, we are borrowing money. So, uh, Richard Nixon borrows money, Gerald Ford borrows more money. Then we get to Approach 1980, Jimmy Carter's borrowing less money, but look at this. Ronald Reagan's borrowing a lot of money throughout the 1980s. It's starting to level off. He's borrowing a little less money. Now George Bush is borrowing money. And then this is the last full year of the Bush administration. And we have, during the Clinton administration, we're borrowing less and less money until we get a surplus. Well, these are the four years. This is the second Clinton administration. 
These are the four years of the second Clinton administration, and we're going to end up with a huge surplus. September 11th hits, and you know, the games begin again. We're borrowing a lot of money. Iraq and Afghanistan starts. The economy is roaring. Deficit starts to decrease. And then the recession is going to hit, and oh my God, look at this. That's all borrowed money. And what that does is, each year that we borrow money, the amount we owe increases. And it gets more and more and more. So the debt is the accumulation of the deficit, year after year after year. How does this relate to unemployment? Well, again, if you take a look, I'm not going to do the whole chart, you can figure this out, but let's go to George Bush into Bill Clinton. So, George Bush, unemployment is rising during a recession that occurred at the end of his presidency, and then during the boom years of the Clinton administration, unemployment keeps dropping, keeps dropping, keeps dropping, keeps dropping, keeps dropping, keeps dropping, keeps dropping throughout the entire time of the Clinton administration. You understand why people thought they were doing well. The recession hits, I'm sorry, not the recession, we hit the beginning of the Bush administration, and unemployment starts to rise. It drops again, and then we hit the end of the Bush administration and it skyrockets when the Bush recession begins. So, one of the big debates is what should the government do? Should we increase taxes to pay for some of this debt and deficit? And this is a historical chart of taxes in the United States, income tax. And if you take a look at this, for example, starting all the way back in 1913 when income tax begins, the tax rate is low, it's about 6%. Then, we're going to go into World War I, it's going to go pretty high, it's about 78%. After World War I, it's going to drop in the 1920s, it's very low, it's about 22%, and we hit the stock market crash. Well, that's going to throw us into the New Deal, government spending, so we have an increase in taxes to pay for government spending. World War II, obviously huge government spending during World War II, and we have a top tax rate of approaching 98%. I'll explain what the top tax rate means in a second. After World War II, it starts to drop off. This is the baby boom era. We have a top tax rate of about 95% throughout the 1950s. The whole Eisenhower era, Republican president, very high taxes. In the 1960s, we're into Vietnam, our tax rate drops down to about 75%. Now, we start to go throughout the 1960s into the 70s, stays relatively high. Ronald Reagan takes office, he lowers taxes. He lowers tax to 55%. Well, now we're in the Reagan administration, and Reagan's, going to go, Reagan's tax is going to go to a low of about 32%. And then during the Clinton administration, they're going to rise again. They're going to rise into the upper 30s, and then we're going to go through Clinton administration, end up in, in the Bush administration, and we're going to drop taxes again. Dropping taxes because George Bush thought that we should give the surplus back to the people. So this idea of low taxes is a relatively modern idea if you see all these years the tax are so high. Now when we talk about the marginal tax rate, that is the last 10% of a person's income is charged is at that high tax rate. Because we have a graduated tax system. For X amount of dollars you pay a certain tax and you pay more on the next bracket when you earn more than that first bracket, then you pay more on the next bracket, so you pay a different amount on each bracket until you get to really high where you're paying all of that. So you might be paying, uh, let's pick 75% Reagan years. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll pick right here. In this time period, it's not really Reagan years, in this time period, you're paying 75%, but you're paying 75% on the last $30,000 or $25,000 of your income, not your entire income. And it's only if you're a multimillionaire, because tax rates are variable depending on income. So now, people say we shouldn't have high taxes. High taxes are terrible. But, well, take a look. Take a look. Let's see. Um, we have FDR, 94% tax rate. We have Eisenhower, 87% tax rate. We have Lyndon Johnson, 77% tax rate. We have Richard Nixon, 70% tax rate. We have Ronald Reagan, 28% tax rate. We have Bill Clinton, 39% tax rate. We have George Bush, 33% tax rate. And Barack Obama would like the tax rate to be approximately 40%. Even at 40%, which is about here, He's still lower than all of these guys. And if you want to look back historically, the economy is roaring in this time period, and the economy is roaring in this time period. So high tax rates do not 
cause an economy to sputter. It can actually move an economy forward. It's what's done with the economy. Think about the Eisenhower years when taxes were at 87%. We built the national highway system. We launched the space race. Think about all the jobs that were created during the Johnson administration when the top tax rate was 77%. Think about all the jobs that were created while we were fighting the Vietnam War and the size of our military. When we start to cut taxes in the 1970s, the economy really starts to falter. We get the whole stagflation thing. When tax were low during the Reagan administration, we got this huge deficit in debt that came out of it. That was absolutely incredible. When we had higher taxes than Ronald Reagan, we had an incredible economic boom that occurred. When we had lower taxes at the end of the Bush administration, again, we fell into a recession. Right now, we have slightly higher tax rate, about 37% for our top tax rate, and the economy is recovering, slowly albeit, but the economy is recovering. Taxes are like taking a bath. There's probably an optimal level of water in the tub for you to get clean. Less water than that, you're not going to get clean. Less taxes at an optimal level, you're not going to be able to run the country. So this, this crazy notion that let's keep cutting tax, let's keep cutting tax, let's keep, let's keep cutting tax is ridiculous. Something has to fix the bridges and the roads. Something has to pay the military. Something has to pay the police. So, moving forward, a comparison. Tax rates and federal revenues. Well, here's the top t marginal tax rate. And regardless of what happens with the tax rate, you see federal revenues as a percentage of GDP are staying relatively constant. Over here, you see how we compare to other nations in the world in our top tax rate. Denmark has a top tax rate of about 50%. France is in the 40s, Britain is in the 30s, Germany is in the 30s, Poland is in the 30s, Canada is in the 30s, Ireland is in the 30s, Australia is in the 30s, Switzerland is in the 30s. The United States, before the recent tax rate increase, was at a high tax rate of 28%. So, only Japan, South Korea, and Turkey, and Mexico below us. Maybe our taxes are too low. Maybe we need to pay more taxes for an optimal level to occur, because all these countries have done pretty well. So now we have the debate. The debate between democratic and republican philosophies. Do we want a more activist government with direct help to the people and the economy through government actions and investment in the economy? Do we want tax increase on the wealthiest Americans to support those government actions? In other words, do we want a government involved in the economy with the rich paying for it more? Or do we want less government intervention in the economy, which means more individual responsibility? Do we want lower taxes? You know, everyone loves lower taxes. Do we want the job creators to be burdened by excess taxes from the government and government regulations? Well, if you believe in this, you're more likely to believe in Republican philosophies. If you believe in this, you're more likely to believe in democratic philosophies. There's no wrong and right here. It's a matter of what you believe the role of government should be. And that is the oldest debate in American history. What should the government do? Right after that is state versus federal government. And right after that is who makes the best peace in the United States. But nevertheless, the debate continues about all of this. And regardless of how you look at it, this is a huge debt. And how do you pay back that debt? Well, you can hope it goes away. But if it doesn't go away, it's only get larger and larger. You can raise taxes to pay it back. You can also rein in some spending to pay it back. It's probably a combination of both. Doesn't matter, we need to do something, and we need to stop arguing about it. So, to get back to where we began with all of this, whoops, let me get this. Yeah, let's back to the beginning. You can find this PowerPoint at www.bushhistory.net, it's topic 30, and I will post it right after we get, I get done editing this video and putting it up. The next topic will be look at some modern issues, and then I'm going to go into some review for the AP exam, which is just a few weeks away. Take a look at the Bush History Timeline videos. They're pretty good. They walk you right through the entire American history course, course with a cause and effect relationship. Of course, I got an email that on my timeline in 2006, I had George Bush being reelected. And yes, I know that's an error. It should be 2004. I just didn't catch it. It happens sometimes. Anyway, for now, I'm David Bush, and uh, have a great day. See you soon.